everybody? I know how to handle an audience. You know, handling college kids give you strength and skills you never thought you'd use, but you need them right now, right? So, and working at News Channel 5, I can hit a mark, so don't worry about me in time. I'll probably finish early. If you do this in the audience, I'll rap, I promise. <laughs> so, in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, people try to figure out where our topics come from, but I think we're divinely ordered. I think things come to you in ways you could never imagine. A friend last night was joking, saying that you smoked a joint and came up with that, didn't you? I said, no, I promise I didn't. I promise, I promise I didn't. Steve Jobs used LSD, I used sleep. As long as I get a nap, I'm good to go. So, without further ado, innovate. The Underground Railroad is back. Shh, shh, don't tell nobody. Shh, okay? What I did was, I was doing research years ago just on black culture, black history in America. And now I do innovation and networks and all the things that we're dealing with now in the virtual world. And somehow it just clicked. The Underground Railroad is among the most effective, disruptive, and innovative networks in U.S. history. You think about that. At Harvard University, Dr. Clayton Christensen does research on disruption. His definition of a disruptive technology is one that appears outside of an existing system, in the bottom of the market, comes up relentlessly, and disrupts the status quo. How many of you are in an industry that has been or will be disrupted? Most everybody, and some of you not raising your hands, it will happen. Because technology is changing things. Then you think about the internet. The internet probably will be the most effective, disruptive, and innovative network in US history eventually. But as we've all today been talking about looking back at the past to understand the present, to predict the future, this is a critical period in history to think about. Beyond Harriet Tubman, be, besides historians in the room, how many of you can name any other central figure in the Underground Railroad? Y'all just looking at me all simplified. <laughs> Are you here? Are you breathing? <laughs> Anybody? It's a John Stewart moment, right? Anybody? Anybody? I was the same. You know, they said, oh, Harriet Tubman, and I've been called Harriet Tubman. I don't know why people call me a troublemaker. I just speak my mind, that's all. If you ask me a question, I tell you the truth, and I move on. It's simple. So, moving forward, what I did in terms of analyzing this concept was create the seven principles of innovation, seven elements of innovation. Every time I read a book, whether it was by Clay Shirky, Malcolm Gladwell, Seth Godin, all the wonderful people, my colleague Eric Qualman, reading all of these books, some themes came clear. When you're dealing with innovation or creativity, most people are trying to solve a problem. There's a principle upon which they stand. There's a purpose, a direction they're heading. There's a perspective, the mindset that they have. And they're pioneering, they're unique, they're original, or they're creating an original remix of something. They're also passionate, and there's an element of play. So, do you have time for me to break this down real quick? Y'all still awake? Anybody need coffee, tea, anything? Okay. So, in terms of the problem, the problems were everywhere on the Underground Railroad. And ironically, the problems are the same today. Freedom, access, boundaries, and privacy. Right, that's a, ooh, that's a, mmm. <laughs> right? That's a moment in time. And so as you start to think about the internet, what issues are we facing as we discuss net neutrality and other issues of monopolies and oligopolies and people with more control than they should have over the lives of other people? So when you start to think about what's next, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, even though we did have one on stage today. <laughs> we had a real one today, right? In terms of principle, when you think about the Underground Railroad, the principle was freedom. And they wanted safety. They wanted their families to be as safe as possible in this process. And you had people like Levi Coffin. Now you can name another character in the Underground Railroad, right? Another person, not a character, another real person. Levi Coffin was the unofficial president of the Underground Railroad. And he facilitated slave escapes all the way to Canada. Now, mind you, let's break this down really quickly when we think about slavery and the enslaved. When I say enslaved Africans, I mean those who were held against their will. 
When I use the word slave, I'm talking about those who volunteered and stayed as slaves even after the Civil War. Nowadays, I argue we have more slaves than enslaved. We choose because of the way we've been raised, the way we've been taught, to do things a certain way without thinking outside the box. It's almost as if we're afraid not to be the same. We're wearing the same uniforms. We're going to maintain that status quo. Even though we know change is happening each and every day, we're still doing the same things the same way, saying, this is not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen. What happened to newspapers with Craigslist will not happen to my industry. What happened to the music industry will not happen to my industry. What's going on right now with Coursera and edX and everything else will not disrupt higher education. I'm going to leave that alone because I need my paycheck. So we're going to leave that there. <laughs> so let's move forward. Purpose. Every initiative they had, they had a goal to go forward. And they didn't measure it. Nowadays, we're so caught up in analytics, we're paralyzed. It's almost like we can't move. You're scared to try something unless you can prove it can succeed, yet people keep telling you, you've got to fail. You've got to take a chance. You've got to take a risk. Imagine the enslaved African leaving a slave plantation in the dark of night, in the dead of winter, not knowing what he, because most were men, young men, not knowing what he would face, whether it be weather, whether it be a slave catcher with a gun, whether it would be a dog, whether it be a little slave master's girl, daughter who would say, hey, I know that slave. But they took the risk. Nowadays, people don't want to risk their livelihoods when people before us risked and sacrificed their lives. I know it's, it's coal miner deep up in here, right? Y'all so quiet, you're scaring me. You're really making me nervous. And I can't see you, so I don't know if somebody got a bead on me or not. If somebody sees a red light, let a sister know, and I'll be off stage. Okay. So, oh, don't play. They put me at the end. I'm like, look, you know I'm going to blow this stage up for putting me at the end. I'm telling you right now. They knew what they were doing. All right. We talk about perspective. This is one of my favorite areas. It's mindset. And being in the South, I grew up in the North. And so we didn't learn about the Civil War the way the Southerners learned about the Civil War. Y'all got a whole different spin on that there thing down here. <laughs> so as I thought about it and started doing research on it, I said, the South kept looking this way. I hope I'm straight back there, but it's all right. The South kept looking behind because they kept saying King Cotton would return. That's after the land had been raped, after they had reaped out of season, they were trying to get crops out of season. Oh, yeah, the messages are deep up in here. <laughs> they were doing things out of season, and they wanted the past to remain and to return, whereas the North was much more forward-thinking. They embraced immigration at that time because they needed them to work those factories that were just starting up. So immigration back then, Andrea, wasn't a bad thing. It all of a sudden became a bad thing. They needed those immigrants at that time. So, and by the way, too, with black folks, we weren't immigrants. We took a ship ride that we didn't want to take. So we are involuntary minorities. Just, just had to throw that in there just in case somebody wondered. So when we talk about this perspective, this mindset, the adaptability and flexibility, most of us talk about embracing change, but in reality, we hate it. We hate it. Let a traffic jam hit and you have to go a different route than you want to go. Right? It's a moment in time. You got to woo and breathe and get your music right. <laughs> I don't want to hit this traffic. So in terms of pioneering, that's another P, being unique. Each slave escape had to be new because otherwise the slave catchers and the masters could figure out what the slaves were do what the enslaved were doing. So they had to change. They had to adapt. If somebody was hot on their trail, they created fake wagons. They put in a smoked ham to cover the smell of the slave. When you start to really read and research and think about what happened in history and how things are repeating and how those lessons are relevant, it'll take a whole lifetime to put it together. And the internet is the same way. And I'll double back to that in a minute. In terms of passion, how many of you consider yourselves passionate about something? You found your passion. You know what it is. That's a good thing. Because a lot of people really don't know what that is. But they were so passionate, not only about their own freedom. The ones who escaped, typically, many of them had families. They went back 
The men did not abandon their families. Many of them died and got caught returning to get their families. And for the record, it was white folk. It was black folk. It was Indian folk. It was Canadian folk. It was everybody working together in a flash mob. <laughs> You're seeing it now, right? Because why? Everybody wanted the same freedoms. Some people helped not because they wanted blacks to be free. They helped because they didn't want to be enslaved too, because they figured out common sense. If anybody's fr not free, everybody's not free. So when they figured that out, they said, hold up, wait a minute, Southerners, we love y'all. But don't bring them rules up here, because we're not going to fool with you. Because if the Africans die off or leave, who are you going to come get next? They were thinking. Play is my seventh principle. And a lot of people say, how are you going to talk about play with slavery? That, that's a, a, a rough mix. That's almost like the weatherman being tossed to after a murder. And the weatherman has to say, yeah, there's some dead people. We got some sunshine today. <laughs> right? It's like, really, who, who put that story before me, right? 20 years of TV news, right? I'm crazy. So when you think about play, think about strategy. It was strategy. They had to outthink elements, they had to outthink people, they had to outthink unknown elements. That's why they created so many codes and different ways to communicate. Nowadays we talk about passwords. Back then, thank God they didn't have text. Thank goodness they didn't have a record. If they could have been discovered, it would have been destroyed. That's why it was what? A leaderless movement. We talk about leaderless movements today, but if you go back in the past, that was one of the most successful leaderless movements on U.S. soil. There was no central location that could be destroyed. So here you had this group of disconnected people connecting just in time. Does any of this sound familiar? It makes sense, doesn't it? But the blessing and the good thing about all of this is it's coming together in this one point of innovation. What is innovation? Creating something new, right? Thank you, thank you. I don't know who that was. I can't see worth a darn because the lights are right here. But thank you. Another word for innovation, y'all ready? Faith. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can't see an innovation coming into fruition. You can't tell somebody about what doesn't exist. Meredith Perry sat here last year and blew this stage up, and I loved her talk because she talked about the engineers telling her she could not do what she's done. They said it's impossible. She said if it hasn't been done, how can you say it's impossible? Think about those slaves one more time with a chain on their leg literally running off of a plantation. You can't make it to Canada. They were so bad and bold, they walked to Canada. You know, personally, I get mad sometimes when I got to walk to the refrigerator, but that's just telling the truth. <laughs> but think about that and how we are today and how many people really did help make that the most effective, disruptive, and innovative network in our history. This is a prayer circle. In my research, I went to Cincinnati, and this is at the Six Acres Bed and Breakfast. And the home was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And the woman who renovated it left this prayer circle upstairs so that she'd always remember her ancestors. When the slaves would come here, the enslaved would come here, they would sit in that circle to ask God's providence and protection on their journey. So we talk about passion. We talk about play and all these other different concepts. All seven came together in this prayer circle. They had a destiny. And I was saying today that your destiny is already there. It's just waiting for you to arrive. So when we start to think about the past and the present and the future and asking the question of what's next, we'll see what's next in a minute, right? This is my imagination talking. A political battle in augmented reality for intangible digital goods, because you know you don't own anything that's in the digital space. Mm, we can talk about that later. Digital goods for freedom, boundaries, access, and ownership, creating a leaderless movement facilitated through flash mobs, coordinated to accomplish certain goals in a certain amount of time, culminating in an epic win on the virtual Underground Railroad. I made that up. Can you believe that? 
So I promised I would end early. I don't think they believe me, but I want to let you know, innovate, apply the lessons from the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad never terminated. We don't know exactly when it started. It never ended. So never forget the Underground Railroad can appear at any given time. But apply the lessons from the Underground Railroad, and let's get back to helping one another like we should. Thanks.